The more I talk to people about an issue which is global warming, which is a very contentious issue, the more people say, well, what difference can I make or we in the UK make when the biggest polluter is China? I'm Dave. Welcome to Dave Takes It On. Now, I'm not going to go into a wealth of figures. That's not what this is. But this is really to just have a look at an overview of what's actually happening. I think the first thing I would point out is that if there is a problem with global warming and if we are contributing towards it or causing it, then every little helps. Tesco. Um, every little is important and it might seem trivial but I did release a video recently saying that if I buy a car, the difference in my global impact, my carbon footprint, is relatively small. But if I can influence others by seeing it, driving in it as a passenger, um, then that's having a bigger impact. And by running the channel, I can have an even bigger impact. So from little acorns, great oaks grow. So that's one thing. But what we really need to do is have a look at what's actually going on in China, which is cited as the world's largest polluter. Uh, and I believe it still is. On an average uh, average day, average week, average month, uh, they're still using coal-fired power stations. They've still got nuclear power stations. Uh, but in the last 12 months, they've installed enough PV, solar PV to be the equivalent of five nuclear reactors. It's an amazing achievement. The problem they have, they have really cheap coal, very lax health and safety standards um, and very cheap labour. So to them, they are in a position where, and this is not defending them, but they're in a position where their growth is actually outstripping their power uh, and they can't produce the renewable energy fast enough. They can't make solar panels fast enough or wind turbines fast enough to meet that growing demand. So they are installing uh, new coal-fired power stations, which is not the best thing to do. By the way, we've just um, got a bit of an argument going on just up the road from here where uh, in Cumbria uh, someone wants to open a, an open cast mine, a coal mine. Yeah, like that's going to go down well. And the government, the previous government, supported it. Uh, the locals are up in arms, even though it would create jobs. It's not where we want to be. So there will be occasions where people do things in the short term for a long term result. And China is very much like that. They've moved ahead. They took a dramatic stance uh, about 20 years ago uh, and they declared that it was going to take them a good 20 years to be able to develop their own motor industry to a sufficiently high standard that they could start exporting to the rest of the world. And somebody sat down and worked out that by that time, 20 years, 2020 effectively, uh, that the petrol cars would be on the way out and that the answer would be EVs. So they said, well, let's skip all the uh, petrol stuff. Let's go straight into EVs. So they made some appallingly bad cars like the Japanese did in the early days. Uh, but that was all 20 years ago. They got rid of that. They've worked their way through that. And since then, a huge number of industries, EV industries, have sprung up. And it's now absolutely dominant. It is the world leader. There is no one out there who's got more experience. Uh, and I include Tesla in that. Tesla have a very innovative way of looking at things, which is different to them. But they started before, uh, before Tesla, before Elon Musk even got involved. Uh, so they've had a huge, uh, huge uh, growth in experience. Uh, they've had a lot of uh, government funding. Uh, they've had a lot of government support, a lot of subsidies for people to actually buy um, EVs rather than ICE. And many of you will remember the Chinese Olympics uh, with the Bird's Nest Stadium, uh, where for about a week before they actually ran the Olympics, they had to shut down all the factories nearby because the air quality was such that a lot of the athletes were refusing to go there because it was actually dangerous to the health. And we see that even today, uh, last week, in um, the, the Paris Olympics, where it was touch and go whether anyone would actually swim in the um, the triathlon um, because it was swimming in the Seine, which uh, they seem to have the same people dumping 
you know what into uh, into our waterways um so the uh, china had decided to clear up its act it wasn't going to do it overnight nothing like on this scale can be done overnight they have to keep going in the meantime it's a bit like uh, saying that um, i got involved in the green party a little while ago uh, and they said well we want to ban cars you can't do that you ban cars tomorrow the whole country falls apart you can't do it uh, and when it turns out, I did a bit of questioning, I ended up writing some papers for them, uh, but I did a bit of questioning. So well, look, let me just ask you a hypothetical question. If you could produce a new car that uh, had solar panels on it and it gained its own electricity, nothing else involved, and each day, just by parking it in the road, it could get enough electricity and it could drive. And while it was driving, it produced zero pollution. Would you ban that? And they said, well, obviously not. So I said, well, what you're trying to do then, you don't want to ban cars. What you want to ban is the pollution that they cause. Oh, yeah. Never thought of that. And this is what's happening. You can't, in China, for example, you can't just switch off what's been going on for years and say, right, this is the answer for the future. There's a transition. And China now is installing more PV panels than anyone else in the world, by a long way, by a long way. They're also involved in wind turbines. They're also involved in uh, batteries, obviously grid connected storage batteries. They've got the biggest battery manufacturers in the world, CATL, BYD, and a number of smaller ones. So they're all heading in the right direction, but this isn't going to happen tomorrow. And in the meantime, they have to keep industry going. They have to keep the money coming in. And so if they need power and they can't get enough PV or they can't store it or whatever the situation is, they have no choice. It either shut down the industry that wants to, uh, but wants to produce something or uh, just build another coal-fired power station. And you can't blame them for that. We did it. We went through that phase. Uh, about 50 or 60 years ago, all we had was uh, coal-fired power stations, a little bit of hydro. That was it. We've been through it. So, in a way, who are we to tell China that you can't have coal-fired power stations? We've had ours. Oh, we've moved on. So you can't have them either. It doesn't work. So what we're in, we're in a bit of a transition period and people just get very impatient these days. We've gone on to, um, oh, everything's instant, isn't it? Uh, I wanted something. I was getting interference on the sound on here and I needed something to, some test equipment to find out what was doing it. Um, and I ordered it last night at, I think it was about seven o'clock. Uh, and there was a knock on the door at eight o'clock this morning. It arrived. It, we just live in an instant society. I noticed recently you can now order a Starbucks coffee to be delivered. One coffee and someone will drive up uh, or cycle up. I don't know which it is. And they'll deliver one coffee for you. This is a crazy world. And when we look out at the, the world at large, we try to pass that on to it. We try to think, well, we should be able to tackle global warming, poverty, food shortages, droughts, everything. And it was last summer, um, particularly with Germany, when we saw the droughts they had over there and the River Rhine actually running very, very dry and low. And they had to stop a lot of the barges, which moves a lot of their industry. They don't use lorries in the same way we do. Uh, they use more uh, these barges on the river uh, and the river got so low they couldn't actually do it. And for the first time, they realised we can't do anything. If it doesn't rain, we can't fill the rivers up ourselves. Doesn't matter how good technology is, how good scientists are, it needs to rain. We could ask the scientists to try and make it rain, uh, but even that doesn't work. They have very little control over it. And we suddenly realise that there are some big things that are very, very slow to change. And this, unfortunately, is the transition we're going through at the moment. A lot of people, me included, uh, I'd love to be able to do my bit a lot more than just an electric car. Um, a lot more than just panels on the roof. Uh, a lot more than just a battery in the house. Uh, get rid of the gas central heating boiler and put in a heat pump. The problem I have is I have a limited budget and I can't do them all at once. So I have to time myself. I have to space it out. I have to do what I can afford 
at the time, then I need to do something. And people say, how, how come your wife drives around in a petrol car? She does about 4,000 4, miles a year and the car's running quite well. At the moment, we have no need to uh, change it. Uh, the mileage is low and it doesn't make any sense financially for me to do something. There's not enough cars on the market at the right price range that this car's in uh, to be able to replace it with an EV that would do the same job because half of that four or five thousand miles a year is actually a journey, a uh, round trip journey of a hundred miles. Um, she has a, an elderly mother uh, that she goes and visits and so she needs to be able to jump in the car. She goes once a week at least, uh, drives to mother, visits the mother, comes back and occasionally if something's going on she might need to go another time. Uh, for her she does need a range of about 100 miles and the earlier cars, the cheaper cars, they just don't do that. But I would like to and if that car fails or when it fails uh, it will be replaced with an EV. Same with the boiler. When the boiler fails, that will be replaced with something else. So we do our bit in our own time. And there's no point just blaming someone. Oh, it's China's fault. And until they do something, I'm not going to do anything. Everyone needs to do their bit. And if everyone does just a little bit, that adds up to an awful lot. And that awful lot now starts making a big difference. So that's it. I'm not pro-China. I'm not pro-anyone. Uh, I'm just uh, quite pragmatic about it. If all of us decided to do a little bit, that includes the oil companies and governments and factories and everything, all decided to do a little bit more uh, just to help, uh, we could actually get rid of an awful lot of the problems that we have today. So anyhow, thanks very much for watching. I'm Dave. And if you've enjoyed this, please click the like button. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe. Thanks very much.